episode of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Marcy Glenn, CEO of Another Source, is our first guest on the radio show today. Are you finding trouble finding the right people for your firm? Well, Marcy Glenn, when she returns here to the show, she's going to talk about some real-life staffing situations that are facing middle market companies just like yours. But first, let me let you know that this business talk show is live on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. And Thursdays at our special time of 3 p.m. Of course, all of our shows can be heard live exclusively on Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. If you're listening to this show as a podcast, first of all, thank you. But also, we'd like to encourage you to listen live during our broadcast times. The show is brought to you by our advertisers, Brandman University, Center Club, Commercial Bank of California, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, SNH Rubber, Succession Strategies, Tone Software, and UPS Protection. The goal of this show is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs running middle market firms, to improve your decision making skills. Marcy, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have you back. And um, maybe people remember you from your first appearance on the radio show, or maybe if they're listening live, they remember you from an earlier show on octalkradio.net. Either way, Marcy Glenn, tell us a little bit about your background and your firm, Another Source. I'm the CEO of Another Source. We've been around since 1991. We're a recruitment services firm, and we focus on uh, mid-level positions in accounting, finance, sales and marketing, operations, and supply chain. A little bit about me and how I ended up here. I grew up playing competitive tennis, and, and when I learned that wasn't going to be my lifelong career, I thought I'd... At what age were you when you learned that? Mm, I'm, I, I think I'm still trying to learn, actually. <laughs> uh, the do- senior tour. No, not yeah. yet. You were much too young for that, but do- someday maybe. Dove into accounting, which I was uh, very happy inside of a spreadsheet, um, but realized that um, that really that I needed a little bit more contact and, and opportunity to impact business beyond that. So I started my career at Ernst & Young, um, moved into consulting, uh, and then joined another source again um, in 2000, which is um, where I've been ever since, and, and took over the company in 2006. So you were there for six years before you took over the reins as CEO of another yes. source. So you took over the reins right as the Great Recession was about to hit the industry. Yes. So uh, congratulations on still being here Thank and surviving you. that Thank experience. You. That's no small feat, is it? No, no. W- w- give us a general sense of from the clients that you work with. Um, how are the job postings? W- what's it looking like on the job front from an employer's perspective? I think from an employer's perspective, you know, everyone's own reality is is reality. And, and so you have to think about what's going on in their business and, and what constitutes their perspective. So I think each for client has a bit of a different perspective. But from an employer's market, they, I think, overall still think that we're coming out of the recession and that there's a lot of choice on the market. Um, from my perspective, I think the candidates uh, have the choice right okay. now, for okay. sure. Well, I I echo your sentiment in that, you know, I lead CEO peer groups, and this year for the first time, I'm hearing on a consistent basis in one of the three groups that somebody has lost a key employee. Mm -hmm. And for six years before that, the conversation was about um, how do I afford to keep the key employees because they're so important. Now, you know, people are starting to look, and it is true that it's the best the people you want to lose least that leave first right so are, are you are you seeing that too that you know people are confident now to leave their current job to look for new employment mm-hmm. you know i always like to say candidate confidence mirrors consumer confidence and so okay. when you see consumer confidence in the market and what we're hearing that is echoed by candidate confidence so they get the confidence they can start looking again and the passive seekers become active seekers and, and you know i think the especially for the type of positions that you fill um, looking at the unemployment, the national unemployment number is misleading, right? There's a loss. My sense is there's less unemployment in the areas of the skilled workers and the type of the positions mm-hmm. that you're filling for your clients. Right. Agreed. I think there's, um, I, I think a, a, there's a skill gap. Um, I think there's also an aging workforce that is happening. Right. And then I think you also have, as a result of, of the recession, people have changed the way they live. And maybe they went from a two-income household to a one-income household, and they're comfortable staying that way now because they've learned to adjust. So you have a lot of different factors converging at one time 
uh, that's impacting the talent market right now. I find it interesting that, and I'm talking with Marcy Glenn, she's CEO of Another Source, that Another Source really has strategic relationships with large recognized institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, we happened before the show started talking about some some on the West Coast, and I know that you know you're out of the Pacific Northwest and you have a strong representation in San Diego and other markets. But um, how, how does your firm cultivate and develop? those kind of relationships with such large institutions. That's got to be almost a maze a bit to figure out who's who at the zoo kind of a thing. Right. Not that your clients are zookeepers or anything. but Absolutely. Well, I think we're, we're constantly and continuously learning. Um, but I think that it, in itself is a key factor. The, the, you're willing to learn and you're willing to have a business model that can adapt to what works best for the institution, but still allow the institution to reap the value that you as a partner can bring forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a balancing act. And you have to um, you have to be adaptable to what that looks like. And you have to be constantly pushing yourself to continue to learn. I think it's like any business when we sit back on our laurels or we think that we, you know, can go into maintenance mode with any sort of client is when we're always caught off guard. So why do they choose to do business with another source? Large institutions can pick and choose, right? I mean, they're courted by courted by many service providers. Mm-hmm. How do you get in there and secure the What is it about your firm that is a differentiation? I think there's a couple of things that come to mind. Number one, we focus on mid-level positions. So we're outside of the executive search and we're above the the staff augmentation or the temp sort of of positions. And so that that mid-level position is where where you have a lot of mid-level managers that need all the help that they can get, uh, but they don't have a lot of budgets that are resourced for mid-level recruitment. So with our fee model being flat and and time-based, um, it's a it's a great match for them. It fits within their budget resources. It gives them the help that they need um, and attention that and help that they haven't had before. So how do you pull that off? I mean, because you're you're offering tremendous value then, but with that also is a risk, right? If, you know, flat fee, time based. I mean, you, you, there are certain inherent risks. It sounds like in the business model that mm-hmm. your firm and other source has to absorb. How do you, as the CEO, balance delivering the value but also managing a profitable business then? I think there's a couple uh, things that come to mind. I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself, it was a recent conversation I actually had with a client, um, you know, and how do, how do we make sure that this is a, a win-win partnership exactly. for both sides? Right. And I think when you when you truly have that partnership, you can have those kinds of conversations and, and both want each other to succeed. Uh, but how do I pull it off? I think there's two things initially that come to mind. One, our infrastructure. Um, in order for us to uh, be profitable and, and be able to grow and continue to offer even more value to our clients, our infrastructure has to be um, consistent. It has to be able to deliver for us. Um, and that's what we've done. We've invested a lot in our infrastructure and our systems and our software that enables us to do what we do. Okay. Um, I think the second thing is, and it, it sounds you know really simple, but we, we do what we say we're going to do. Um, and that allows us to have the credibility to come to the table and say, hey, we need to adapt here or we need to flex here right? Um, because we've, we've built that. Right. Yeah. Doing what you say you're going to do it sounds simple. But actually at times it can be hard because mm-hmm. you may inadvertently, not intentionally, overcommit or miscommit. Sometimes you really, you know, you put your best forth effort forward and you still don't get the results. So, it, mm-hmm. yeah. Being in the CEO position, uh, I was never the CEO, but I was president of Delphi. And what I learned is... Uh, n- there's never anything that's totally good news, and there's never really anything that's totally bad news, right? Well, there's well always said. shades yes. of gray on every, you know. Yes. Once, once in a while, I just want something that was just really good news. But even like a big order, you go, and I, we were manufacturers, like, oh, now I have to get the material and the parts, and I have to build it and quality. It's like, oh, right, right. now the work begins. I think they call that growing pains. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, Gro- grow- growth is good in business, but it always comes with a little pain. It does. It does. All right, we're talking with Marcy Glenn. She's CEO of Another Source, and we're going to take our first commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. You're not going to to go anywhere because we're going to talk with Marcy when we get back about some real life common issues and factors that are facing staffing and recruitment for middle market companies, staffing and positions, the type of positions that another source services. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back after these words from our commercial sponsors. Can we talk about your family business? You know, that thing you put your whole life's blood, sweat, and tears into? Well, what happens when you retire or try and pass that business on to your children? At Succession Strategies, we can help you find the answers. We'll guide you through the unsettling process 
of protecting your family legacy and successfully passing your business on to the next generation safely and securely, ensuring that it'll both survive and thrive for generations to come. So ask yourself just one question. Can I really afford to wait? Take the first step. Take our complimentary self-assessment at SuccessionStrategies.com or call us at 714-560-9022 to set up a free consultation at your convenience. That's Succession-Strategies.com. Today's businesses are embracing voice over IP telephones and unified communication desktop technologies to more effectively communicate and collaborate with their customers, suppliers, and colleagues. The Reliatel management software from Tone Software Corporation helps organizations of all sizes manage their communications technologies to ensure great voice quality and better levels of service and reliability throughout their business. Through Reliatel, you'll gain higher return on investments from VoIP and unified communications technologies while lowering the associated operational support and maintenance costs. Learn more. Visit www.tonesoft.com or call 800-833-8663 for information on Reliatel by Tone Software, the solution for quality business communications. Commercial Bank of California, or CBC, is a well-funded, full-service bank located in the heart of Orange County. CBC is ranked in the top 6% nationally for financial strength. Commercial Bank of California was founded in 2003 by a group of Orange County's finest entrepreneurs. To this day, our bank is governed by our founders, including General William Lyon of William Lyon Homes, Alex Morello of the Morello Group, and Frank Willey of Fidelity National Financial, to name a few. In short, we are a bank founded, built, and run by entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs. Not every business in Orange County should be our customer. However, if your business is looking for a bank that can assist in finance, production, analytics, and risk management, there's no better bank to choose. To understand the true power of how Commercial Bank of California can help you achieve your goals, give us a call at 714-431-7000 or visit us on the web at www.cbcal.com or at our new headquarters at 19752 MacArthur Boulevard in Irvine. Member FDIC. Welcome back to this edition of the Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Marcy Glenn, CEO of Another Source, is our guest in the studio. I'd like to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our radio shows, a podcast. You've downloaded over 16,000 shows during the last 30 days. And we here at the program appreciate your continued and growing support. All of our shows can be heard live on octalkradio.net or rebroadcast anytime from Apple iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, for those of you in Europe, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com, is a very popular website throughout Europe. And hundreds of middle market companies whose past guests on Critical Mass Radio Show have put the radio show on their website, as well as various business-oriented podcasting services. All right, Marcy Glenn, let's benefit from your recent experience. I'm wondering if you can... Help me to answer a couple of these questions as it relates to middle market companies, which are our audience. Why, why, like we talked in the first segment, why is it always the best people that leave first? I think they're, I think they're, they're telling us and we're not listening. Okay. So there are signs that we, I think, I think so. Okay. When I, you know, when I look at it from my perspective and if I'm in a conversation with a hiring manager after a key person has left and we're talking about the recruitment, you know, they're telling themselves as well as telling me that they, you know, they knew all along. They just didn't, they didn't respond to it. And I think, you know, in any situation, we all have a lot on our plates. We're all trying to balance. We're trying to meet the needs of everyone. And I think there's a point in, in time in which you take for granted that key employee because you can have transparent and and honest conversations, but out of that has to come action or response as a leader. Hmm. And I think, you know, oftentimes that gets overlooked because we are having a transparent conversation, but the expectation of the leader doing something about it is still there. 
So it's almost the emotional intelligence of the leader isn't quite enough to pick up on the signals and the conversations that they're having. Or maybe they're discounting the seriousness by which the cut, the best employee might be considering leaving? Yeah, I, I think they're telling us, and, and whether we t- choose to explore that at a deeper level or we respond to it, you know, may differ in each situation, but right. there's very few times that I hear of a key person that's left without sharing or giving signs and warnings up to it. I find it curious because my only experience on it is either having been the employee where the key employee left or maybe on occasion being the key employee if you go way back in my career or recently observing it this year in the peer group, the boss almost feels hurt slash betrayed that the person left. It's like, how Mm -hmm. could they do this? Mm -hmm. They were my key person. Right. It's like, well, if you'd have just had this conversation, I I almost want to say, if you'd have just had, have you had this conversation with them before? I mean, did they know that you felt this way? It's almost like too little too late when they've decided to leave the company for you to pour on and let them know how valuable and important they are. It's sort of, it's like a missed opportunity Mm -hmm. to me. It's sort of what I'm hearing you saying as well. Absolutely. You know, telling us and then us as leaders or, or managers doing something about it you know, there's two steps there, right. listening and then acting. Right. Um, and, you know, after a while, listening doesn't doesn't suffice. Right. And I would think the middle market positions, the type of positions that you're helping your institution customers and your other clients to fill, um, those people probably, and this is a generalization, tell me if it's accurate, probably haven't seen a lot of career opportunity given the recession. And so now that there's the opportunity maybe to, for career advancement, it might look more attractive outside Because they didn't experience the past few years with that company like they did with their current employer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a safe generalization. I think, you know, what what most of us saw during the recession was a lot of extra responsibility, um, trying to do more with less, which is a natural response. But out of that, you know, some some are okay with that, but others do want that advancement. And understanding what advancement means to someone is key. You know, just as we're when we're interviewing or engaging someone for the first time, it's, what are their motivators? How do those motivators align with their decisions in their career thus far? And how does, you know, company X align with their motivators? So Okay, so you said a key word, which is, you read my mind. Are assessments valuable? When you say motivators, I'm thinking about putting people through tests to understand mm-hmm. what truly they self declare as a motivation for them? You know, I think assessments, is a, it's a big word, and to some it's a bad, big bad word. <laughs> uh, and, and to others, it's a really great tool. And I think... Uh, my experience, both within our own organization and, and with my clients, I think assessments are great as a tool. And, and if you can use it as a tool versus a weapon, and you can use it and seek to understand the value that it brings versus being black and white on it, I think the more tools you have in your tool belt, the better. Okay. Um, what do you mean tool, not a weapon? Well, I like it, <laughs> but I may not miss it. I may right. misunderstand. Well, it. let's take it from our own. Let's take it in our own context. There's a lot of personality assessments, and and maybe the first couple of times you go through a personality assessment, it feels great to know that you, your personality or your communication style can be put in a box, right? right. Okay, gosh, Marcy, you are so direct. Well, that's okay. I'm this personality right. style. I'm a D. I'm a high right. D. Right. I'm yeah. a high D. Gosh, it feels good. I, you know, I'm justified. Right. Um, but if I don't use that information as a tool to help me better communicate, it becomes a weapon in my in my relationships or or my communications. Instead of using to think, gosh, how could a high D impact this situation or how could I adjust myself based on knowing more about myself so you know that's my view on assessments if you can use an assessment as a tool to help you make a better decision or an assessment to help understand how you can find the right fit for your organization great I think the more tools in your tool belt Um, but it isn't and I don't believe one answer okay we were talking about the disk assessment which is a very popular uh, tool for communications and kind of understanding people uh so you're a high d anybody in the room high i that i can think of or yeah maybe? <laughs> my, my entire staff is oh, 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 oh wow that should make for some fun meetings all right what about looking for talent in your at your competitors How, what's your view as a professional in this space about that what do you tell your clients i think there's there's a couple of things if it's a if Based on the need of the opening, if it's skill-driven or if it's fit-driven um, or if it's a combination of both, you have to know how you're going to assess and vet that in the person that you're recruiting. Um, a lot of times, it maybe it's not in a, a competitor, but it's a, maybe a large organization or a complex organization or an organization that's similar to ours so that someone knows how to navigate it or right. work within it. But the assumption there is that just because they're large, they operate the same way. 
Um, so I think you have to look at it from, if you're going to recruit from your competitors, you have to look at, is it a skill I'm going after? And that skill is so valuable to my organization that I can give a little bit on the fit standpoint, mm-hmm. um, or is I'm an, am I going to recruit, but I'm going to recruit the person that is going to fit the best. Okay. Uh, uh, my bias on it is, is I think it's dangerous to recruit, not exclusively, but heavily from your competitors because you're importing their culture. Mm-hmm. And you said fit before, and I think that's Similar. that's always dangerous. Absolutely. And I, I find it, when I have clients who overdo that, the employees that were there before you brought in all these employees from the competitors start looking around going, well, what the heck, what's going on here? Sure, sure. Are we them now? Right? Right, absolutely. What are the, what, What's there that we didn't have? Right. And I think, you know, the other thing that's facing us in a market today that hasn't, you know, faced us previously is, you know, from a technology standpoint and a technology skill area, you know, they are pulling from their competitors quite, quite frequently because it has a, a skill piece that just doesn't exist in the market. Right. That, that's and the only other person that ha- a company that has those kind of exactly. people. Exactly. Because we're in the same space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And it's moving so fast. Mm-hmm. I can't train people for this. Mm-hmm. Talking about technology, though, kind of a, a different rail, but what is your recommendation on using social media and profiles? There's so much now available on candidates, either intended or unintended. What is your position on that with your clients? My position and, and, and general advice to my clients is twofold. Number one, what's your company policy on it? Do you know it? Uh, second, if you're going to look, look consistently across the entire candidate pool, not just one candidate. Um, and, and really, number three, what is it that you're seeking to find? Are you seeking to find something that you want to screen them out on, or are you seeking to find something to screen them in on? Mm. Um, and, and typically, when we go through that conversation, I, they, they typically have their answer, at, you know, that m- maybe I don't really need to look, you know, from that standpoint. I think um, the... the some people refer to social media and include LinkedIn in that, right? And and some don't. I, I think LinkedIn oh, that's is an important distinction. Yeah, and and so I think you have to look at it and say, you know, LinkedIn is generally a professional medium, right. whether that's a social medium or a networking medium or a job posting medium. But I think looking at LinkedIn is is a, a professional medium that you can look to see, you know, how as a candidate portrayed themselves. Yeah. Um, I would expect openly. to see them put information in their profile mm-hmm. that would be beneficial to a hiring manager, right? Say as opposed to a Facebook, which may be a more personal place. I, I would just—I've not been involved in this process, but I would think it'd be difficult as a hiring manager if you discovered something on a social media site for one of your candidates to even approach that in the interview, right? And should you be approaching it, in right? The interview? That's what I mean. Right. I mean, how do you even open the door for that conversation? Right. You may turn off a great candidate because they may think you're like creepy or something, right? right? Or too, absolutely too you know, NSA like. Right. Absolutely. And I I think a lot of times we're not educated on what we should be looking at and what (laughs) we shouldn't be looking at. And, you know, so, you know, check with your company, know what the company policy is and, and, and how do they want you to use it? Right. And I think what you said earlier, and I'm talking with Marcy Glenn, she's CEO of another source is be consistent across your candidate pool. I think that's, that's important just to protect your company from people who aren't happy that you might have not hired them. Right. So, words of wisdom here, ladies and gentlemen, on Critical Mass Radio Show. All right. Think about a time in your professional career, Marcy Glenn, where you learned a valuable lesson, maybe a lesson you carry with you today as CEO of your company, but it came out of what was at the time a difficult or may even, may I say, a painful experience. And if you mm-hmm. have one, can you share that with our audience? Absolutely. Um, you know, it is a, an experience that I carry with me and use as a leader. Um, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, which was the listening. Um, you know, I had a, a very key employee leave um, in the first six months of becoming CEO. And um, all the signs were there. All the conversations were there. And I was so worried about learning how to become a CEO that I was ignoring mm. my talent um, and and my key, my, my, my biggest asset in the organization. Um, and that mistake cost not only the organization significantly, but it cost me a lot as a leader um, and something that I look back to now and think, gosh, I'm grateful that I learned it and that I learned it so early on. Thank right. you. Right. But it came at a cost that was so significant to the organization and to my leadership that I'm reminded of it constantly. Great. Boy, it's, I love asking that question because invariably it doesn't sound like it happened that long ago, right? Because you were 
first in the job in 2007? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Six? Yep, two th- yeah, 2007. Yeah, so, I mean, that's seven years ago. Right. And you're still able to speak about it with a certain emotion, which is good. Mm-hmm. That's why we asked that question here Thank on Critical you. Mass Radio Show. Okay, Marcy Glenn, CEO of Another Source. Uh, our time is up today on the show, but I wouldn't let you out of here without asking you to share your website with our audience. How do people find you online? They can find us at www.anothersource.com. And uh, information on how to contact me, Taylor, Stephanie, Heather, we're all there. That's the team, huh? Yep. Another source. All right. Well, thanks for being a friend of the program, a repeat Absolutely. guest. Absolutely. It's wonderful to have you here when you visit us here in sunny Southern California. I'm sure you'll be back in the winter when the weather is hopefully nice here in Southern California. And well, you know, welcome and continued value member of our community. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. That was Marcy Glenn, ladies and gentlemen, CEO of Another Source. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back with our second guest on the radio program after these words from our commercial sponsors. Imagine what it would feel like to lose everything. Your job, your home, your family, your dignity. This has happened to thousands of the men, women, veterans, and young adults we serve at Working Wardrobes. What do we do to help? We provide career development services, life skills workshops, job skills training. We provide the perfect interview outfit, and we get clients placed in jobs. Call Working Wardrobes, 714-210-2460. Donate, volunteer, invest, hire. If you are an Orange County CEO or a business owner, this message is for you. Do you ever feel isolated with no place to turn for advice or feedback? Who holds you accountable to your commitments in your company? Where do you find the right resources to help you and your company grow? If you have had these questions, then Critical Mass for Business might be the answer for you. Critical Mass for Business is committed to helping you make better decisions through the power of peer learning. These are groups of peers who are running businesses just like you. CEO Peer Groups provides a great sounding board to test fresh ideas and new concepts, review your strategic plans and tactical goals, and present issues and opportunities for a critical discussion. The result is improved strategy, accountability, and improved business results. If you are interested in learning more, go to www.criticalmassforbusiness.com and learn about our CEO Peer Groups. CEO Peer Groups is a registered trademark of Critical Mass for Business. SNH Rubber is a manufacturing company in Fullerton, California. We specialize in custom molded, extruded, and stamped rubber parts. If your next job requires a rubber part, we would appreciate the opportunity to quote on it. We serve aerospace, automotive, and many other industries. We work with many types of rubber, including silicone, EPDM, neoprene, uninitrile, and viton. Our quality system is ISO and AS9100 approved. Over our 47 years in business, the SNH brand has become known for superior quality, quick turnaround, and competitive pricing. Please check out our website at www.shrubber.com or call 714-525-0277. Let SNH be your ceiling solution. Commercial Bank of California, or CBC, is a well-funded, full-service bank located in the heart of Orange County. CBC is ranked in the top 6% nationally for financial strength. Commercial Bank of California was founded in 2003 by a group of Orange County's finest entrepreneurs. To this day, our bank is governed by our founders, including General William Lyon of William Lyon Homes, Alex Morello of the Morello Group, and Frank Willie of Fidelity National Financial, to name a few. In short, we are a bank founded, built, and run by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Not every business in Orange County should be our customer. However, if your business is looking for a bank that can assist in finance, production, analytics, and risk management, there's no better bank to choose. To understand the true power of how Commercial Bank of California can help you achieve your goals, give us a call at 714-431-7000 or visit us on the web at www.cbcal.com or at our new headquarters at 19752 MacArthur Boulevard in Irvine. Member FDIC. Welcome back to this edition of 
Critical Mass Radio Show. Sorry about that. Do you want to avoid risky business litigation? Well, Annabelle Bonfa talks to us about some common types of business litigation and how to avoid them in this segment. But before we get there, I'd like to let you know that our audience demographic is 98% business owners and executives who listen to learn from our guests, like Annabella. If your firm is interested in reaching these top decision makers, then advertising on our program is the answer. Each month, our sponsors gain valuable exposure through their support of our program. And with our exclusive prospect engagement program, we will deliver you up to 23 warm prospects each year. If you'd like to learn more, call Rose Chamora at 951-515-4661. That's Rose Chamora, 951-515-4661. If you're, if you're listening live, you can call her right now. She's just outside the studio in the green room. I'm sure she'd be happy to speak with you. Annabella, welcome to our show. You're an associate at Wellman & Warren LLP. Tell us a little bit about your professional background, kind of your path to your current position. Well, my path was quite direct. I actually joined my firm, would you believe it or not, in high school when I was <laughs> 17 years old. (laughs) My aunt was a legal secretary for my current firm, and I'd come over the summers as a file clerk, and then, uh, what can I say, 14 years later, decided to. uh, you know, decide, you know, decide to practice law. I was going to become wow. a marketer, actually, and I found that I really enjoyed working at a law firm and servicing clients, and it had a draw for me, so I never left. Well, I, I've had a lot of attorneys, and, and I, I think they would say they've enjoyed working at a law firm, but I don't think they've demonstrated it the way you have from at such an early age. I guess it was just meant to be, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I was the person sitting out in the hall during trial, you know, holding somebody's hand where they were ready to throw up pretty much, <laughs> <laughs> trying to calm them down, and I, I thought I was you know, pretty good at that, oh. and I've, I've enjoyed having a client relationships. And- so, so let's talk about your firm, Wellman & Warren. What you know, we're going to be talking about business litigation, et cetera, but what else, what, what is the composition of the firm? We are half transactional and half litigation. The, the transactional side, you know, we have many entrepreneurial types that have their own businesses, many of who are multi-level marketing companies, such as, you know, Herbalife type companies. Mm-hmm. It's a very hot field right now, and, you know, when the economy goes down, a lot of people decide to pursue their entrepreneurial dream, and so we okay. have quite a few of those different clients and different companies. Some more successful than others, right. but um, all of them owning a business for the first time. Okay, so that's the transaction side. Yes, and the litigation side, uh, the side that I do, is pretty much specializing in trade secrets and breach of contract, meaning theft of confidential information from companies, which is very hot right now. Is it? Mm-hmm. Why? I think because information is so easy to steal. You know, it, before it, you'd run off with two bankers' boxes, and now all you need is a thumb drive and a computer right. port or a cloud. There's stuff stored in the cloud, and you just need to move it off the cloud too. Yes, right? yes, you so, can upload things to uh, Dropbox right. and other other different means. It, you know, we have middle market companies, and not lower middle market, hundred million dollars and smaller, kind of two to a hundred million dollars. <clears throat> Are these issues? affecting them as well. When I hear about, you know, trademark and intellectual property, I, I think of big companies that have all these secrets and formulas and things that they're losing. But does it also impact middle market firms? Yes, especially middle market firms. You know, every company that has clients and a client database and has pricing information and, and advertising information, even if it's, you know, when they're going to launch their new product. That's what I was thinking, product plans, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I'd say the client database is, is the, the thing that most people try to steal first because they want not only the names of the clients, but they want the pricing information and what the client has been doing oh, over the last 10 the years. the stuff that's not publicly available, right? Because one would argue, well, you can get out of there, you know, off the Google search, their address and name and all that contact information, but pricing sure. history is not public information. That's pretty clear. Yes, and if you have that for the last five years, then it's so easy to undercut the prices of your previous employer that it's ridiculous. So you're on the litigation side. So we don't have time, unfortunately, and I'm talking with Annabella Bonfa, and she's with Wellman and Warren LLP, for you to share stories of how that happens. But that, that, that must be a very interesting profession to be a professional litigator because of the emotional aspect of well, what you must do, yeah. not for you personally, but for your clients. I think all litigation is extremely emotional, and it's scary, actually, for the client. Clients are frightened because they're out of their element. It's like 
putting me into an you know, emergency room. I don't know right. what's going to happen first. What is the IV? What, what's happening to me? And it's, it's, it feels like something out of your control. So a lot of our job is not just explaining the law to our clients, but getting them through the process, which is not easy. Right. And let's see. I've only been involved in a few places where I had to need someone of your talent, and it is very disruptive to the business, If even even if you feel like you have to do it. So I'm not suggesting people not hire you to do the litigation, but my sense is it almost has to be the last recourse. For, if, you got to try to solve it in other ways, if at all possible. Am I stepping on your toes? I mean, No, not at all. I think that if you can work things out without litigation, you should certainly try, and, and you should certainly try to do every protection you can to avoid litigation in the first place. Right. And part of that is protecting your information so it's not going to be stolen. You know, password protecting it, making sure that people understand what data belongs to the company versus, you know, what is their data as the salesperson. And if you make that clear to them, you're less likely to have problems when they leave. Yeah, because I could see a scenario where you you hire a salesperson because she has a Rolodex. She brings a Rolodex to your custom company. Flip forward a few years later, she decides to leave. Why wouldn't she think that all that information is hers? I mean, they were her customers when she came. Right, right. and a lot of salespeople do feel that way. In fact, I defend a lot of salespeople that um, leave companies, and now it's very hot to just go suing the salesperson just because they're a good salesperson and you don't want them to compete against you. That's not legal. Oh, it's not? You have every right to compete against your former employer. It's just that you can't steal information from the employer to go do it. Yeah, because I would think things like CRM aggravate this situation because you're putting so much information into a central repository then if you suck it back out for your own use you've left it probably some type of digital trail and my goodness yes yeah that's why the, the 20 bankers boxes are gone and sales force is here <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, we're talking with Annabella Bonfa, and she's an associate at Wellman and Warren. And we only have a few minutes left before we get to our next commercial break. So I, I don't want to ask you some of the more intense questions that I want to talk about. But one of the things that I, I do know, maybe you can comment on this, is is also fraud and outside companies trying to steal. Uh, we did a fraud form a few years ago, and I was surprised to learn that that small and middle market companies are disproportionately affected from theft and fraud. Not just from your own employees, but from outside hackers trying to get at your info. I thought they were going after Home Depot and you know J.C. Penney or other Target large firms, but middle market companies are affected by this as well, aren't they? Yeah, there's a lot of scams now that are targeted through email just to get your information and then uh, you know steal your identity, basically. Yes, and uh, that is also very disruptive for a business owner and executive. You need so much of your time to run your business if you're being in a litigation or you have some fraud claim i mean you you can you can become non-productive for big chunks of the day and week can't you yes and um the, the smart thing as i said is to try to use your preventative measures to avoid that in the first place and then if you do have to hire somebody and get involved in litigation you know hire somebody that's going to make your job easier rather than harder so you right. can spend more time on your business and less time in court and i think you want a shark as a litigator i don't know i haven't had to hire a <laughs> litigator but i don't think i want uh you know um pooh bear i think i want someone who's going to walk in there and maybe they look like a, a gentle person but on the inside you really have to be able to take the competition apart don't you in litigation you do on some level, but it's not what it is in the movies. You know, people think, uh, you know, I'm going to hire the biggest son of a bitch I can get my hands on. But That's a different in, way of saying it. But in, in reality, a lot of litigation can be avoided if you have a competent attorney who is assertive, but okay. who has good relationships with the other side, because okay. you can work out things before you get So you're looking you for a compromise? Try. Trying to look for an area of compromise, maybe? You, yeah, you need to be tough when you need to be tough, and you need to be uh, soft when you need to be soft. And, and a good lawyer, I think, can have wear both hats very competently and, well, and a, work out your matters. That's a teachable moment there. You just heard it. You need to be tough when you need to be tough, and soft when you need to be soft. Annabelle Bonfa is our guest here on Critical Mass Radio Show. We're going to take our third and final commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to get into the meat of the conversation, which is to discuss some of the major issues that middle market businesses should consider when dealing with the legality of their business. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after these words from our commercial sponsors. There's something positive about the word up. When things are looking good, they're looking up. When someone's down, you cheer them up. So how do you move up? Well, when it comes to getting your bachelor's or master's degree, there's one university that stacks up, Brandman University. 
Brandman is ranked by U.S. News and World Report as one of the nation's top 10 universities for online bachelor's programs. Brandman's online graduate programs in business and education also receive top honors. So look us up at brandman.edu. Brandman University. Move up. Smart Business Network is a business-to-business multimedia company providing insight, advice, and strategy for C-level executives of fast growth, middle market, and large companies. As one of the nation's largest publishers of local management journals, under the Smart Business name, Smart Business Network publishes 19 regional print editions, presents dozens of large and small-scale business conferences and award programs, and produces a vibrant interactive digital media presence. For more information, visit us at www. SBNonline.com. UPS Protection has been protecting systems in the U.S. against brownouts, blackouts, and poor quality power for over 25 years. We provide power protection systems, including UPS, lighting inverters, generators, and service for clients from coast to coast. We specialize in solving all your power needs. As a direct reseller of the best brands in the industry, including Lieber, Powerware, and APC, we can solve all your power protection needs. Protecting your power is our main goal. We offer on-site or depot repair of our critical equipment. To better serve your budget constraints, UPS Protection also offers both reconditioned and new products. Time flies when you're having fun here on Critical Mass Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Franzi, and Annabelle Bonfa. She is associate at Wellman and Warren is our guest. Before we get back to talking with her, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our radio show as a podcast. You've downloaded over 16,000 episodes of Critical Mass Radio Show during the last 30 days. And we here at the program appreciate your continued and growing support. Of course, all of our shows can be heard live on octalkradio.net or rebroadcast anytime from iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, and various other business-oriented podcasting services, as well as hundreds of websites of middle market companies across the country where the CEO has been on the radio show and they've posted the player on their website. All right, let's talk a little bit about, maybe you could touch on the major areas where a middle market company can be exposed to kind of litigation. Can you, can you just kind of step through those with us, please? Of course, there's the basic uh, breach of contract action. And a lot of times companies have casual relationships. They're not casual relationships, but friendly relationships with another company. And so they tend to have a lot of oral agreements with each other. Or maybe they have a nice contract, but then over the years, you know, they get comfortable with each other and they just start changing things orally. Not a good idea. You definitely want to have everything in writing because you don't want to be going through 10,000 emails over a 10-year ten- ten- period trying to figure out how the contract changed. Okay. Whatever your contract is, it's better to have amendments, changes to it that are in writing, signed by both parties. That way, you always know what the agreement is. And it doesn't take that much time, that but people don't do sense. it. The power of the pen. I, I have even seen the person with the best notes sometimes is... It has an upper hand in the con- in the discussion too, right? That's right. Just, Otherwise, it's your word against my word right, kind of thing. Right. But if the person who takes the time and they don't have to be copious notes, just key points or something, and save them in a place and can find them. Right. Wow, that that is daunting, right? To go back five years and go, well, actually, versus your memory of what we talked about. Okay. What other areas should? Trade secret is very hot, as I was as I was telling you. People steal information, and since our customers and the information our customers share with us, like their pricing habits and their marketing habits, and you know everything that's vital to your business, is often in a CRM program or some kind of program that has data in it. Right. You want to make sure that all of your employees understand that 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 data belongs to the company. So you have an employee employment agreement that explains to them this data belongs to the company. You have them sign other agreements saying if you ever leave the company, you understand that the data is ours and you will not take that data and take it Mm -hmm. to your new employer. If it's all spelled out and you have password protection with different passwords for every single employee, then you can track who's taking the information if that ever happens. And you're in a better position to take legal action to basically prevent them, get an injunction preventing them from using your stolen information to compete against you. Wow. But how do you know they do or don't use the information? Well, I think it's in this day and age when so much information is available through emails. You know, if if you find the email where they're basically 
I know my old company, you know, charged you two bucks a pound, and oh I'm going to charge you a dollar ninety five. <laughs> You'd be scared at what people will put in an email. That is unwise at best. Oh, I've even seen emails that uh, there's some cool stuff in my old employer's program. Join me for a go to my PC meeting at two o'clock, where we can take the information, take it to our new company. Holy cow! It happens. Well, what about? Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent here, and I'm talking with Annabelle Bonfa. What about if you're the hiring company and you're hiring this person not for that reason, but yet they somehow bring it with them, or they unknowingly to you are doing these kind of things what is your obligation there as the employer well the smart new employer hiring a hotshot salesperson from another company will protect themselves by having them sign an agreement that says uh, you understand that our company we don't want stolen information from your ex-employer you will not bring to us the stolen information you will agree okay. that you, you will not take it to us on your computer and you know you will allow us to search your computer and make sure it's not on there in the first place and that way you're in a great position if your new employee gets sued to defend yourself and say here's my agreement you know we looked it wasn't there he was duty bound not to bring it to us and you're in a great position to defend yourself wow that is that is worth the price of admission right there ladies and gentlemen because i would have never considered having as the hiring company spelling out that we don't want you to bring illegal information with you as a new hire i mean that's that's uh that's a good idea annabelle bonfa thank you uh any anything else in this area that that you're litigating and your experience suggests that ceos of middle market companies should be aware of well, the salesperson or some VP leaving an old company starting his new company should also think about the potential of being sued by the old company. So if you're going to start your new company, you want to start it clean. So one of the things you want to do is if you are going to pitch to your old customers, go on Google and make sure you can get all that information independently. That way, if your old empl- employer sues you, you can say, hey, this is public information. Here's my Google search. You know, I happen to remember John Smith, the old contact, but, you know, hey, what are you going to do? Give me a lobotomy? I have a right to remember his name. Right. I got this information independently, and I have every right to compete against you using information that's publicly available. Yeah, because I would think if in a high-stakes situation, that might be worth the company that lost the employee to at least try to chill them out of the market for a while by filing a suit against them, at least to try to freak them out or scare them or That's drain them of their do. resources, right? Because an entrepreneur has probably less resources than their former employer. So, yeah, that. but then on the other hand, they have to be careful, the former employee, because, again, it's against the law to do that to people, right? So if you're just frivolously trying to chill them out, you could be at risk, too, as the former employer, right? Is that what it's, I heard you say? It's very dangerous to bring a trade secret case without without good information. If you sue somebody for trade secrets and you lose, the other side could get their attorney's fees back, which is usually not the case with most litigation. Wow. Yeah, so okay. you could get your hand slapped real hard and pay yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, so you don't want to be uh, pulling out that card unless you got a strong hand. Okay. Well, th- these are all... Uh, Great advice. I'm glad we're having you here on Critical Mass Radio Show, Annabelle Bonfa. Uh, you know, I I wanted to ask you about the Rotary Club. I know that you're very active here in the Southern California organization. So tell us a little bit about what you do in support of the Rotary Club. I'm the membership director for uh, 5320, which is our Rotary Association going as far down as San Diego and as far north as Long Beach. And we're basically a community service club. We back up other nonprofits by lending our helping hands and members to everything from the Wounded Warriors to the American Cancer Association. And I use my legal advice to mentor young law students and professionals because I think that the perception of lawyers now is that we're kind of a, you know, a questionable sort for the whole, for the most part. And I'm trying to bring back vocational service and community service and trust to the legal profession. And this is one of the ways I do it. Hmm. I want our new lawyers to get their head out of the uh, texting area and, and understand that clients need customer service and they're scared. And handholding is a big part of being a good professional, I think, especially a good lawyer. Right. So, um, Let's talk a little bit more about the Rotary Club here in this area. Um, there are so many chapters, and maybe when people hear the brand of Rotary Club, they may have an image. Tell us about the demographics of the membership here in Southern California from your experience. It is changing rapidly over the last couple of years where, where people used to think, oh, it's all retirees. There's still plenty of retirees, great business people that have been in business for you know, 20, 30, 40 years. But now we have young professionals, too. 
We have as young as college students that are in Rotaract doing community service, and we have a lot of young professionals that are hot in social media and many different walks of life, and now they're joining Rotary because every business now wants to show they do community service. I mean, look at Starbucks. Starbucks has a website where they talk about their 600,000 people that are doing community service. They're proud of it, and a lot of businesses want to help their communities, and they realize that to sell their brand, you, know, you reach out to the people on a very personal level, and community service is one of the ways to do it. It's my understanding that for years the Rotary Club was behind uh, eradicating polio. Yes, and we still world. are. Okay. We, we're almost there. It, it, you usually see two fingers put together like an inch apart, and, okay. and we are that close to eradicating polio, okay. along with uh, Bill Gates and a lot of great other associations out there that are putting right, so money. This is an international focus that the Rotary Club has, and Rotary International, right? It, it's, it's looking at a global problem and trying to make a difference in that global problem. And uh, based on what you're saying, that you guys are close, you're, the whole community is close to making that a possibility. Any sense for what the next challenge will be after you get off of the uh, off of polio? Any talk about oh, that? Oh, gosh, you know, it could be AIDS, it could be cancer. I mean, there's so many, you know, very important issues that need to be addressed globally. Yeah. But um, I'd say the focus of our clubs is really community service. Local like community very, service. Very local community service right. for our nonprofits that are out there. I think it's a great... I've spoken to a number of Rotary Clubs here in Orange County, Southern California, and I also think it's it's a great opportunity to make relationships that are networking, but they're real quality relationships. You know, they're not the superficial networking events that maybe people go to. You actually build people who are looking out for you at a deeper level because of the work that you're doing, and they see you on a regular basis, right? Yeah, it's a great way to uh, make friends with people, and and I think you know friendship is the basis for any kind of networking. Really, you know, right. making a nice personal relationship with people, and what could be less stress free, less stress free to network with somebody than you know, sitting down and you know having a kid's teeth that are being uh, given care by a USC student. You know, you're there under the best of circumstances, right. and you're making friends and hanging out. So if somebody's a business owner that's listening, maybe wants to become active again in, in the community or get active in the community or a young professional, it sounds like if they Google Rotary Club, they'll find a chapter in their city or locale where they are and they can maybe attend as a guest to see if they want to join, right? Yeah, they can go on uh, rotary5320.org uh, and, and they'll see all the different clubs and come by and visit. And I think uh, they'll enjoy the experience and make some friends and have some good breakfast or lunch. There you go. <laughs> All right. Annabelle Boffa, tell us how people can find your firm's website, Wellman & Moore and LLP. How do they find you online? Well, um, they can put in, go straight to the website, which is www.w-law.com. Or the, they just put in uh, Wellman and Warren, and we come up right away. Or they could put my name into uh, LinkedIn, because mm -hmm. I'm a big LinkedIn fanatic and give a lot of presentations about LinkedIn. You're going to have to spell your name for us, for the yes, audience. It's uh, A-N-A-B-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. The last name is Bonfa. B-O-N as in Nancy. F as in Frank A. Well, I want to say thank you for being a friend of the program, being a part of our Critical Mass radio show community. Continued great work as you support the Rotary Club and supporting your clients and helping them and the issues that you're helping with. I've enjoyed this today. Thanks again, Annabelle. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to go here on Critical Mass Radio Show. I'd like to thank our sponsors who make this show possible, Brandman University, Center Club, Commercial Bank of California, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, s &H Rubber, Succession Strategies, Tone Software, and UPS protection. If you'd like to learn more about Critical Mass for Business, maybe you want to refer a future guest or you're interested in becoming an advertiser here on the radio show, Critical Mass for F O R Business.com is our website. Until the next show, this is Rick Franzi saying I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction.